Good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going to give it just one or two more minutes and let uh, let some people file in here um, before we get started. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are joined today by Dr. Roy Larrick of Bluestone Heights. My name is Eric Pretzlov. I'm an AmeriCorps member with the Chagrin River Watershed Partners. Um, during this broadcast, we will record it so you can go back and watch it later on our YouTube. Um, there is a question panel on the right. Everyone is muted. Uh, but you can use the question box to um, type your questions throughout the presentation. And at the end, we'll have some time for um, Q&A. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Larrick. Thank you, Eric. Good morning. And just to reassure me that I can be heard, Eric? Yep, loud and clear. Yes, okay. very good. Uh, nice to see you all this morning. And uh, I want to thank Chagrin River Watershed Partners for inviting me to do this. And uh, we should have a good time over the next half hour, 35 minutes, while I make the presentation. And then um, we have, I hope, a good time for question and answers and some nice questions, I hope. Right, I'm going to fade in here. I am going to turn off my own camera here. so. We're full screen. And the uh, Chagrin in time, Chagrin Valley in time. And um, uh, I want to go through a lot of natural history and some cultural history. The early settler period, the Native American and early settler periods are of great interest to understand how the transformation of the watershed begins back in the 1790s to 1820s. And uh, so I represent Bluestone Heights. I used to call it, now I call it Bluestone Conservation. And it's my brand basically under which I uh, participate in watershed advocacy and restoration around the greater Cleveland area. My own uh, specialty is in the long-term end of things. I am a Paleolithic archaeologist, retired now, uh, but Paleolithic archaeology is concerned with the Earth's earliest humans. Uh, you can take it back to the divergence from uh, ape-like primates, but for me, it's got to be at least 10,000, 11,000 years old to be interesting. That is, the Ice Age has to relate to the Ice Age and uh, before agriculture. So, uh, retiring from that, I come back to Cleveland, to Euclid, where I grew up, and uh, I naturally turn to the geology. There's no Paleolithic archaeology in this area, but there is a lot of Ice Age geology, which I know decently well, and is of great interest and underpins all of our uh, all of our restoration efforts. So I'm trying to get my screen to advance now, and um, I'm it, not sure what. It's not advancing. If you stop sharing and then start sharing again, it should. Stop sharing and start sharing. All right.
Um, let's try that again. Stop sharing. Maybe let it wait a minute. And uh, sorry about this, everybody. Funny how it always works in practice and then never when you need it. Yeah, we had it worked out. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing again and I'm going to get. Where are we? Perhaps, perhaps through PowerPoint. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Let's click. Let's share again. There you go. Uh, next okay. slide. It's the next slide. Good. So I once again, I want to call out Chicago River Watershed Partners and uh, an excellent organization that does a great job in their mission there of protecting, re restoring, and supporting. And um, uh, I am very pleased to be a colleague and work with. CRWP on a number of projects. The uh, two slides here are very similar, and to me, they embody the Chagrin River, the whole watershed, the valley, as I want to call it. And uh, so at the base there, here's the Chagrin River. And of interest is that, well, it's pretty clear, but and that is in, in terms of water clarity, it's clear. Uh, but you can see that there's a lot of sediment. This river does carry a lot of sediment. To me, it can be the siltiest of all of the regional rivers because it drains high areas, such as we see here, Gildersleeve Mountain, um, and a couple of unnamed uh, knobs that we'll talk about in, um, in a little bit. But uh, the difference in elevation is from about 1250 feet up at the top here to down here we're at about 620 feet. So there is uh, 600 feet of difference and uh, this river is trying to carry away everything that's between Gildersleeve Mountain and the river here. Usually it's just clay and uh, sometimes the water has little of that, so it's clear. But there's a lot of times after rains, especially hard rains, when the Chagrin River carries a lot of fine sediment that is the result of trying to clear out this entire area as all Lake Erie tributary streams are trying to do. Oh boy, we got, I wonder if there's a time I'm having a hard time advancing again. Why would that be? Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for this. If I escape and then go to here and then go to screen share again and... There we go. All right, let's see what happens here. Well, what I want to do today is uh, talk about the Chagrin Valley in time, changes over a long period of time within the river itself. And I'm coming in from the bottom, transforming landscapes. I want to talk about all those natural process, processes that have led to an uplift in the earth that gives us land above the sea and then water coming off of it and trying to, as I said before, taking it back to the sea, basically. And so if I'm coming in from the bottom, I want to compare that with how watershed advocacy and restoration works. It is basically a top-down affair. When we attempt to right the wrongs that have been done to streams, that is restoring, uh, we draw from a uh, catalog of techniques that you can apply to certain uh, conditions. And it's in real time, and it's usually in a short period of time as well, or short time frames are uh, the, the goal of these kinds of restoration techniques. And once again, coming in from the bottom here, I want to talk about the long-term events that have transformed that landscape and given it over to what we have today, good or bad. Right. And, and in the past week or so, there have been two people who passed 
from us, and uh, both of them have um, guided me in my uh, own professional development and how I think about watersheds, streams, and people living with them. And the one that everybody's going to know is Edward O. Wilson, um, who sometimes is called Darwin's hair in the sense that um, uh, Eo Wilson's evolutionary thinking uh, was, has probably been the most profound since Charles Darwin came up with the natural selection theory of natural selection back in the 1850s. And uh, toward the end of his life, the second half of his career, uh, Eo Wilson published a book called The Diversity of Life. And it, the, his whole thing was to insist that humans must coexist with nature. That is, we, without acknowledging what nature is and that we're a part of it, we're bound to make mistakes in living with nature that we can't repair. So must coexist. And he always called us, I loved his phrase, we're part of the fauna. Humans are part of the fauna. That is, we are no better than any of the other animals he chose, uh, being an ant guy himself, um, that live on the earth. And um, uh, Doug Tallamy, some of you will know Douglas Tallamy as the, the writer of uh, books on nature these days, published a wonderful book on oaks uh, recently, uh, also one called Bringing Nature Home, uh, which he called a blueprint for community level existence. So as I said, Doug Tallamy wrote a, an obituary of E.O. Wilson, and he talked about his own work as trying to bring Wilson's precepts of coexisting with nature to the community level talking about gardening. Okay? And then the other one that was lost is Richard Leakey, paleoanthropologist, so kind of close to what I do, Paleolithic archaeology, stone tools for me, and bones for Richard Leakey, um, the son of Louis Leakey, who quite a while ago, back in the 50s, said that our past, the human past, is the key to our future, which is another way of saying what E.O. Wilson uh, verbalized, and that is we are part of nature, we're part of the fauna, and to understand that you have to go back to the past to see how we have evolved long term in relation to our close relatives, the apes, and to other animals upon which we depend, and of course the natural environment generally speaking. And uh, some of you may know that Richard Leakey later on in life uh, he had uh, health problems, uh, was in a plane crash, lost both of his legs, could no longer really do paleoanthropology, and turned to conservation. And he saw the study of the human past and conservation as deeply entwined. All right, so let's turn to what's at hand, the Chagrin River, and uh, outlined. Uh, you'll see this frequently here. And I've called attention on this elevation map to the Portage Escarpment, which I'm going to abbreviate as the white line. Um, basically, everything that is uh, yellow and orange and, um, and brown on this map, you could consider as part of the Portage Escarpment. But the edge is right here where we live in Greater Cleveland. And um, what I want you to notice about this map is that the Chagrin is a relatively small watershed. Uh, the Cuyahoga and the Grand are much larger, uh, but all of these three and several others have their origins as pre-glacial valleys. And so they are kind of deep in their widespread. You can tell they're pre-glacial because uh, this wonderful digital elevation model shows the streamlining of the bedrock that the final glacial push back about 23,000 years ago did. And it's very clear in western Ohio, you see how everything seems to be flowing to the south. You can see where the glacial ice uh, caught these bedrock promontories and just, as I say, streamlined them. And the Cuyahoga, the direction was a little different, the Chagrin a little different. The big one is the Grand River, which was a large pre-glacial valley. And you see how that one is streamlined as well. The Chagrin fits between the Cuyahoga and the Grand, and it is kind of uh, buffered by highlands on its east. So in the Geauga County area, especially, and a little bit in eastern Cuyahoga County, it nestles in there between two lobes of ice, one of which descended the Cuyahoga and the other Grand. We'll see this in a, in a little bit. Um, and uh, so within that, we have our Chagrin, 
once again, nestled between the Cuyahoga and the Grand, and especially the Cuyahoga, which loops right around it, and then other larger tributaries of either the Cuyahoga, Tinker's Creek, uh, Euclid Creek to Lake Erie itself, and Big Creek in the upper right there, uh, going to the Grand River. Okay, and I'm going to blow this up in a minute, but uh, the Chagrin River, I think you can see here, has quite a bit of diversity. It's not as high as the highlands in the Grand River uh, to the east on the right hand side. And then, uh, but it's got a whole lot more diversity than the streams of eastern Cuyahoga County, Euclid Creek, and the Cuyahoga Valley. This is in terms of uh, just topography itself. And one of the things you see, all those wrinkles, those are streams that are cutting quickly through loose glacial material. They're creating small ravines that almost grow annually. And the chagrin has a lot of that kind of feature. The chagrin is an active stream cutting down through glacial sediments and through the bedrock. Okay, uh, the geology today is going to be very simple. And uh, the highest point in the watershed is just at about the city of Chardon itself, 1,300 feet above sea level, sitting on top of the Sharon sandstone, the highest rock. And then the lowest is 570, 571 feet at Lake Erie. And the other important uh, rock unit we'll be talking about today is the Berea sandstone right there in the middle, which is the structure around which uh, a number of important features have formed, including Stebbins Gulch, Penitentiary Gulch, and um, the um, uh, Griffithsburg, the old uh, quarrying village on the uh, Aurora branch of, of the Chagrin just before it goes into the main branch. Okay, so uh, we have <clears throat> Um, 700 and some feet of elevation there, and in our part of Ohio, that is a great change in elevation from headwater down to mouth at Lake Erie. Okay, and uh, in time, when I say in time, what I will talk about today is uh, three periods basically. Uh, first two, not so much, but the Paleozoic, the Age of Fishes, the old life era, and that's when our basic bedrocks were deposited under a shallow, warm equatorial sea back in that time range there, a long time ago. And then uh, in the Mesozoic period, the age of reptiles or the middle life area, uh, we had no deposition. We have no rocks from that time. We have a lack of anything because our area was uplifted as part of Appalachian uplift and everything began to erode. And after this early uplift of 250 million years ago, the every almost everything that's happened is eroding rocks away. So uh, cubic miles and cubic miles of sand, silt, and clay have been removed from our region and apparently on their way to the Atlantic Ocean. And then the one that we know so much about, the Pleistocene era, the latest ice age, uh, recent life era, the Cenozoic era, uh, and we have the de de deposition of minor features such as moorings and beach ridges, and then some very interesting erosion features we'll talk about. Okay, And if uh, we could just talk about the major features of the northern parts of the watershed. You know, the watershed is uh, has a vertical orientation and it's hard to fit on a screen, uh, so I'm going to basically focus on the northern part uh, to give my examples. And we have the major tributaries labeled here. But what I want you to see again is this wrinkled of the east branch. The east branch is really cutting quickly downward and through glacial materials. So all these ravines, Stebbins Gulch, if you've ever been there, one of the most wonderful places. The thing about this map is on this map is um, uh, about five different things where when I go there, I think, am I in Ohio? Am I still in Ohio or Cleveland. Stebbins Gulch is number one, Penitentiary Gulch, the old name for it. It's number two, Pete's Pond, we'll talk about number three, and the East Branch right here, this big, in Kirtland, this big um, uh, curve, and the wonderful floodplain there, agricultural now floodplain, this if. And then farther down, uh, some of the uh, more uh, wet areas, swampy areas, Bass Lake, and uh, I put half R here for the Rookery, the Geauga County Park uh, that is in this wonderful old lake bed here. Now, what I want you to see is that 
in all of this activity, we have uh, streams trying to capture others. So let's start over here where you have Pepper Creek that's flowing actually southeast to the Chagrin River here. And then we have Euclid Creek that's flowing northwest. And there's a divide there. That's, this is an old glacial valley that's been filled in by glacial material. And Euclid Creek and Pepper Creek are kind of fighting each other. They're angling toward each other because Pepper Creek has the steeper gradient, the steeper slope here. It's going to capture at some point Euclid Creek and start making it flow to the Chagrin River. You can see a one, another wonderful example of this here, the East Branch, which you know is quickly down cutting, and the Main Branch, which, which uh, starts at Bass Lake, is not cutting so quickly. And look, the headwaters of the East Branch are right here, and the Main Branch is flowing here. You know, if this were let go naturally, it would only be a few centuries before the East Branch captured this part of the main branch and started taking it down north on its own course. Okay, so you can see another one here that would happen if the land weren't managed. This is what I love about the Chagrin River is that there are so many of these situations that are active and it's all closed in. You can see streams working with and against each other. All right, now I want to run you through uh, the most important uh, geological event of the last couple of million years, which is the last glacial advance, the final glacial advance. And let's just take a look at this in, in quickly. So about 24,000 years ago, uh, it had been, um, mm, there had been a retreat um, and a no ice in our area at about uh, 50 uh, to 60,000 years ago. But by 24,000, uh, we've got ice coming up the Erie Basin into our area. And it's starting to go into the low lands of the Grand River, into the Cuyahoga. And, you know, I'm conjecturing about the Chagrin, but by 23,000 years ago, it's going up the Chagrin Valley as well. We have good evidence for this uh, on Mill Creek. Uh, that at 23,000, the ice was advancing over a small pond uh, in uh, Mill Creek, uh, tributary of the Cuyahoga. Okay, so, you know, it keeps going up these valleys. It's, as you can see, Chardon is the little rectangle there that's just about to be covered up. Still not quite covered up. Maybe at 21,000, the details are conjectural here. And, but by 20,000 years, what's clear is that our whole area is covered with ice. And 20,000 years ago is about the coldest time in the last 100,000 years. And so it is uh, quite a severe climate and the ice is advancing quickly. But then it begins to warm at about 19,000 and um, we, can, uh, we can trace the retreat. Now, I made this coming animation up for another uh, another uh, purpose, and I, I know the evidence here, and I can't quite move it east. east. So uh, the audience was in University Heights, which is outlined there in white. Public Square is PS, University Circle is UC, and 3C is Tri-C, okay? So let's watch the ice retreat 17,000 years ago. 16,000 years ago is a clear marker because there's a moraine, the Defiance Moraine, that uh, got deposited as this ice went into stasis. That is, it had retreated between 17 and 15,000 to this point, and then it stopped retreating. The climate had gotten a little colder, and so the ice, the ice kept pushing, and push equaled melt. So you get stuff, clay, sand, falling from the glacier, the front of the glacier, uh, onto the ground, and it makes a ribbon of glacial material that you can trace across Ohio called the Defiance Moraine. And it's it's clearly here and here and uh, up in this area with the chagrin right here. Okay, so this keeps going. Um, 14,000, we have another retreat and another moraine called the Euclid Moraine, and we'll talk about this later, that uh, is deposited and more streams start to emerge. And where the water is going is not clear now, but at least the land is open at 14,000 years and you've got water draining from the high points down into the pre-glacial Chagrin Valley. Whether it's going under the glacier, it's just hard to tell at this point. 
but uh, we have our earliest streams opening at 14, 15 to 14,000 years. And then another one, the Painesville Moraine, which we'll mention. And in this one, we get Gully Brook, which is a major tributary of the uh, Chagrin that um, it becomes important to us in a, in a few minutes. Okay, and then finally, we have the full retreat, and that's that. Okay, so let's go back and consider then what happens after the glacial gla glaciers retreat from our area. We have at least four lakes that form, and the highest one is called Lake Maumee there at about 790 feet above sea level. That's the yellow line, and we don't really know if it went into the Chagrin uh valley as i am doing it but that's where 790 feet is there is uh, the euclid moraine there so anyway that is useful for marking that and then there's lake whittlesea the purple lake warren 730 feet for lake whittlesea 680 for lake warren and 640 approximately for lake arcona here so those are beaches and these dammed up the river and that's going to become important in a little bit. Okay, so let's go to our landmarks. I'm going to uh, talk about a few things here and return to them a bit later. So as we look here, what stands out for me are these meanders, okay? Bedrock, uh, meanders right in the valley. These are not new, but uh, oh, they... Um, uh, they tell us something, and I'll hold off on that story. Uh, but you see the stream is meandering. There's just a few meanders here. And all of a sudden, there is evidence that this Painesville mooring was breached, and the water was able to go out at a lower level. And then the meanders, which had been on top, on top are now working their way down. And then there's this peace pond that we'll get to. Okay. And this one, I think you all know, this is I-90. And as you head east on I-90, you come into the Chagrin Valley. And so you're headed downhill and off to the left, to the north is this wonderful arc of cliffs with Route 84, uh, Johnny Cake Ridge right on the top. And it's 80 to 100 feet high here. So it's just beautiful with the cliff and the Painesville mooring on top of the cliff. Okay, uh, Penitentiary Glen, Stebbins Gulch, Little Mountain, Pearson's Knob, Gildersleeve Mountain, all of our really nice Sharon Knobs, Sand, Sharon Sandstone Knobs that sit above the landscape that are the highest points. Okay, and for my mind, the beauty spots of the Chagrin are uh, the East Branch at Kirtland, and this is at, uh, pretty much at the uh, uh, viewing westward from um, Baldwin Road near 615. Okay, and that it's always cultivated. It's the East Branch. The stream is quite small. This floodplain is wide. This is one of these places where I stand and I say, this doesn't look like Cleveland doesn't even look like Northern Ohio. It looks more like Central Ohio uh, rolling till plain with a, an underfit stream, a small stream in a very large floodplain here. Anyway, it's a beautiful area and significant geologically. We'll get back to it. Uh, Stebbins Gulch, incomparable. Looks like you're in Southern Ohio. Uh, Hocking Hills Park here, same formation here as down there. And uh, the east, uh, tributary of the East Branch is quickly, quickly uh, cutting through this area here, especially beautiful in the winter time. And then my favorite is Pete's Pond, a little known structure that is a tributary of Gully Brook. So if you can imagine here, this is the Euclid Spur or I-90 coming up from the Lakeland Freeway, uh, having just climbed the Portage Escarpment, and it meets well, it curves eastward to be to stay as 90, and then this is 271 headed southward. Okay, so just a little south of this is Gully Brook, uh, the ravines of which are quite visible from uh, I 90 uh, in this area here. And then this old channel that's now called Pete's Pond, which is yeah, unique in northern Ohio as some kind of a glacial outwash. Uh, outwash channel. And uh, for a number of years, I've been trying to get 
Professor John Peck at the University of Akron to come study this, send students here. Uh, Professor Peck is an expert in coring that is drilling down through old lake beds uh, to get sediment and pollen to understand the geological sequence here. Peat's pond needs to be studied to understand when it was cut and what water was actually flowing through it. Okay, This is a large uh, feature. It's, um, it's almost as large as the chagrin as it flows through Willoughby. It's not as deep as that, but it's, it's well, it's more than half as wide as that. It is a, a structure. Once again, I look at this and I think, I'm not in Ohio. All right, and then one more is the Euclid mooring as the Chagrin River cuts through it. And you see the, the bars, the point bar here, uh, uh, longitudinal bar here, and the mooring. This picture is taken from Hatch Otis um, Preserve, uh, which sits on top of the mooring. And the chagrin was blocked by this moraine for a while. See, it's all fine. It's clay and silt, and it erodes right down. <clears throat> the uh, river is cutting through here. So this natural feature is the source for a lot of the turbidity in the chagrin river. It's a natural uh, feature that is primarily clay and silt, and the river is natural. It's cutting through it. There's nothing to be done about this. Uh, in terms of improving water quality, unless you want to change this natural feature. In any event, this kind of environment that you find at, at Hatch Otis is uh, a, a bear uh, habitat, right? It slumps so quickly that plants have a hard time getting a footing. It's all moving down, and that means that more xeric kinds of plants grow on this mooring. It's a little like the shale cliff faces, except it's even more easily erodible. It's uh, so quickly moving that uh, you get xeric plants. You get dry adapted plants, even though it's not a dry habitat, but it is a bare habitat, so ecologically quite specific. All right, now let's turn to uh, some later times. We've come out of the glacial period, and uh, this is a map uh, that I got from the Clean Museum of Natural History, so it doesn't conform with mine, but it's the same area, and it shows Native American archaeological indices as are recorded in the Ohio Archaeological Inventory. And so our Chagrin River is kind of in the middle here, and where you see most of the indices, and these can be large archaeological sites, or they can be a single shirt of pottery, fragment of pottery, or an arrowhead or something. It doesn't matter uh, the size, uh, but if it's, in, as I say, an index of Native American occupation, it appears in this map. And the uh, great abundance are at the confluence of the Cuyahoga and Tinker's Creek here. And if you know that area, it's a broad, the Cuyahoga has a broad floodplain, and another broad floodplain of the lower Tinker's Creek meets it. So it's an area of, of uh, of level land, expanses of level land, uh, and good soil. So it, <clears throat> there are some major village remains at this confluence area. And then other things, I don't know what's going on here in Independence and Brexville, um, Seven Hills, uh, but there are quite a few indices here. Uh, the lower Cuyahoga in this area was occupied, uh, mounds, and uh, other kinds of artifacts. Dome Brook has a little bit, Euclid Creek a little bit, and the Chagrin. You know, the main valley of the Chagrin has a few indices, but not all that many. I'd like to compare, so the main branch and the Aurora branch coming together, compare that with Tinkers coming into the Cuyahoga. It's an area that has some broadish floodplains, but they're just not broad enough. These are not village sites, or at least long-term village sites here at the confluence of, of uh, the two branches of the Chagrin. Maybe a little more, it's hard to see, but you have the East Branch, East Branch coming in, and um, 
uh, it's really hard to see, but you have some things up here. And then now these are survey areas that the museum did, but uh, just out of the picture here is the largest site in the Chagrin Valley, which is called the Reeves site or the Reeves Road site down Lakeshore Boulevard, basically, as it crosses the Chagrin River in the Lagoons area. And that was a village site occupied for several decades, the Whittlesea phase or Whittlesea focus. Uh, so uh, 1300 to maybe 1500 AD is the area of, is the time of that site. Okay? But I think most interesting is in the upper chagrin, you have not a dense concentration of Native American indices, but they're there. And, you know, they're going to re represent a couple of arrowheads found, or once again, some pottery shirts. But they're scattered around in this area that is heavily dissected, that is eroded. And you have ravines uh, where you can uh, trap game, so to speak. You can, uh, at least the game deer and the like, are limited in how they can escape when you are in these narrow ravines. So you've got a number of people hunting and you can bring down a number of deer, uh, or in, in the old days, elk, uh, bison, okay? And in the very old days, mammoths, but I don't think this was a good mammoth area here. The mammoths are in lower areas. But uh, I'm quite impressed with Bass Lake. Um, here is another one that has quite a few indices and maybe they were fishing for brook trout, uh, which are still in this area here. Okay, so that's our Native American. There's not too much to say about it here, except, all right, I'll make one more contrast here, and that is the kind of, um, oh, there we are, uh, the occasional distribution of Native American indices here. Compare that with the west bank of the Chagrin <clears throat> toward the Guyoga, whoops, and where there's nothing. Okay, and this area until you get to Euclid Creek down here, and this is the area on top of the Euclid Bluestone, which has been uh, scoured bare by the last glacier, and there are no big ravines. There are no ravines that lend themselves to hunting. So I'm just going to speculate here that this area was never occupied very much, never hunted very much, as opposed to the highlands of uh, the, Ch the Chagrin on the east side of the Chagrin, which uh, provided much more habitat, I think, for deer and other animals and, uh, and uh, good hunting uh, habitat for humans. Okay, now let's turn to the historical period and um, spend some time here. Uh, I have a great affinity for stone houses as uh, someone who appreciates geology very much um, and have I've spent a lot of time in Europe where many, many structures are built of local stone. If the local stone is there, it's used to build cities, houses, whatever. Okay. And uh, so, so quite a while ago, I did a study of stone houses across the old Western Reserve, and I came up with about 280 sandstone houses and uh, spread all around. Um, and the markers for them here are different colors, and that represents the stone type. Okay? So those that are yellow are made of this Sharon sandstone, the highest stone, and so they're in the highest places. They're in the brown and orange places. The Berea sandstone is down here at the level of the Berea, so, you know, on top of the escarpment, or the Bria actually forms the northern lip of the escarpment, and just under that, the Euclid Bluestone. So there are a couple in Mill Creek Valley, and a couple of um, bluestone houses. And then these are in Cleveland indeterminate, okay? A lot of Sharon Sandstone houses here in Summit County. Um, what's interesting is that if you look at the Chagrin drainage, there are almost no stone houses. It's like a blank. It's like there's an aversion. Uh, early settlers had an aversion in the chagrin drainage to building um, sandstone houses. And it wasn't that the stone isn't there. The stone is everywhere. Sevens Gulch, Penitentiary Glen. Uh, these places are carved through the stone. But what I think it is, is that the, in all cases, that stone is down in deep ravines, and it's hard to access. There were only two commercial quarries in 
the chagrin drainage that I can account for anyway. And one was at the Aurora Branch Confluence, basically. Now there's South Chagrin Reservation, Quarry, Quarry Park Picnic Area. And as some of you may know the term Griffithsburg, a quarry town that thrived for a while in the 18. 50s and 60s, uh, maybe into the 1870s, but it's a ghost town now. It's, there's nothing left of it. And the other quarry was here. This is the Kirtland Temple built of Berea Sandstone, and its quarry is in Chapin Park, just up the road, just up uh, uh, 306 uh, from, uh, from the Kirtland Temple. Okay, And uh, I'm going to show you, as examples of stone houses from this period, two that are right here marked by the same one and then the the one stone house for which i have a photograph in the chagrin drainage is this one mm, at pearson's knob so let's take a look at these okay um this is the most interesting pearson's knob and some of you will recognize this as the former house or uh, headquarters for the Western Reserve Herb Society. They had to give it up several years ago, but uh, this is built of sandstone that came downhill. Pearson's Knob is across the road. Uh, Kirtland Chillicothe, I believe, is the road. Uh, it's a, the, the, the knob, Pearson's Knob, is uh, close by, and what that means is that you didn't have to dig down to get this sandstone. You could go in horizontally in front of you and uh, not have to work against gravity. So you see that this house is built of nice big stones uh, quarried uh, as you would quarry stones for a bridge abutment or some other large feature. It's a beautiful house there. I don't even know if it still stands since the uh, Herb Society left. And then the others are in Concord and Hamden. They're not actually, excuse me, they're not actually, oh yeah, not actually in the Chagrin drainage. Uh, but in the grand, but I think you can see, it's hard to tell, that they're built of thin stones that have been turned on end. I'm sorry that the light is not good here, but uh, this is the sign of economizing on stone. When you build a stone structure, you want to build it with stones that you cut from the quarry and you place them in their original positions. That is, up remains up and down remains down. That's what you see in the Pearson's Knob house here. But in these, these stones have been quarried kind of thin and they've been turned on their sides. So up now faces sideways and down now faces sideways. This is not good for long-term um, maintenance of the house. Uh, these are, this is a schoolhouse and this is a small house. It was good enough in an area where the stone was difficult to get in the sense that you had to go down deep for the stone to bring it out. Okay, so I am impressed by the lack of stone houses in the chagrin drainage. Now, let's go to uh, mills, early settler water powered mills. And these began very early. Earliest one that I know is Halsey Gates in uh, uh, 1826. And that is in the main part of the chagrin here. So we'll spend a little time there and then go to the complex that was Chagrin Falls milling um, 150 years ago. <clears throat> and you see that they are scattered, uh, scattered, but not so much on the Aurora branch and not so much on the East branch, probably because those were not near population centers. The population center was Chagrin Falls. Okay, so Halsey Gates, back in 1826, the Gates family um, came from um, um, Connecticut and they uh, were uh, millwrights by trade. That is, they built mills, uh, not so much millers themselves, although they, some of them did do that, but they were skilled at building, building mills. And so Jeremiah Gates was the first one to come here uh, in about 18... 15, and he went to uh, what's now, what is Big Creek in Old Brooklyn, and uh, built quite a number of mills on small streams there. In 1826, his younger brother Halsey came out, and they scoped out the Chagrin River, and Halsey had in mind to build something big. So they settled on uh, what's now Gates Mills, and the dam, they built this dam here, okay? And then they built the mills here. This is a very interesting situation. It conforms to one type of early settler milling, which is to make a mill race that cuts off a, the shortcuts and meander in a stream. 
So uh, let's go to a couple of historical maps, this one from 1858, this one from 1874, and you see that there was kind of a meander here, it looks better here, it's hard to tell, the maps didn't do streams very well, but if you go up here, there is this meander scar, so this is up here someplace, and you see this low spot here, this is, it's got to be right in here, so there's been a lot of reworking of the chagrin since Halsey Gates put in his mills. Once again, the dam here, and then you can see still the imprint or the trace of the mill race, the head race to this point, and one mill was built on the oops, south side of the road. Get my cursor back, hang on. South side of the road, and another mill built on the north side of the road, and then the main race continued on and finally met the river somewhere in here, okay? Now, uh, there's a little stream that's incorporated into this man-made ravine here and this man-made uh, fill area here, okay? So that's Halsey Gates, and he, uh, Grist Mill was very important, also had a lumber mill here, and then um, later on, a couple of factories, one for turning spindles uh, to make into chairs, Windsor-type chairs, okay? And rakes as well uh, were built here in, at uh, Gates Mills. Let's go then to Chagrin Falls, and I'll start with a general elevation map of it. Okay, so this the uh, the main part of the city right in here, Main Street, and um, and the river coming through the picturesque park right in here. There were several mills, as you'll see, uh, quite a few uh, mills. Uh, and tanneries which need large amounts of water. I'm going to concentrate on one area and that is uh, the Arc Mill and the White Mill which joined up to become the Arc White Complex at some point. You see it's in an old meander scar up here and it is one of these cut off meanders. So let's take a look here back in 1858. You see the chagrin coming down. There's a dam here, so a big mill pond. There was another dam here with a mill pond um, and then this mill race the head race and the tail race going back to the river here so arc factory and white and company here on the on the south side of, of the mill race and a little road that was there at the time okay so let's take a look at that and once again this is drawn from the traces that still exist in the landscape here so the original dam here and a more modern dam that has just a little mill pond, not on the river, not on the actual river here, but this is the older one. And then the head race coming off from where this dam is over and then making a turn, going down a little slope. And this is where the fall was, where the head, the hydraulic head could be produced to uh, drive the mill wheels, okay? And then a tail race, a couple of them that, uh, go from the mills back to the river here. So you see the cutoff was right here. And what this means is that the hydraulic head is generated because, you know, the river is at one level here and going around this meander, it descends quite a bit to this point. And so if you can cut off this meander, you can capture the fall of the river through the meander in one spot in one spot and there you put your mill wheel and this was aided by a natural terrace that uh, allowed uh, the, the mills to be placed right at a fall line okay and uh, the other thing i'll point out here is an old uh, railroad causeway built above the floodplain then cut through this uh, meander uh, remnant here and then the causeway again and this uh, basically i don't even know if this there's no record that this railroad ever functioned. It was built uh, between Chagrin Falls and Chardon with the idea of going to all the way to Painesville. And, um, but uh, I want to show you this part of it here because our next slide will be then the railroads that have used the Chagrin Valley. And the railroads uh, in regard to the Chagrin Valley are a little like stone houses. Railroads did not like the Chagrin Valley because it is too, uh, rough, basically. There's too much elevation change in a short period of time. So you see, now, these are basically interurban lines, Cleveland and Eastern, you know, the electric 
interurban lines from the 1890s through the 1920s. Eastern Ohio Traction, this one, Solon and Chagrin Falls, the green line here, was, <clears throat> it started out as a narrow gauge railroad and part of it was converted. So between Solon and Royal Tinkers Creek to Bedford actually, Solon and Chagrin Falls, um, and uh, this was a steam railroad. So this is early. And then the one I showed you is this orange line coming up through here between Chagrin Falls. And then I've only done it to where this inner urban line is. So you can see the network. But what I want you to see in this is that the railroads chose the pre-glacial valleys, those that had not much water in them like this, but had been uh, excavated before the last glacier and filled in with fine sediment. So you see one here and uh, the remnants of one right here, okay? And then using it a little bit here. There's not a direct correlation between pre-glacial valleys and uh, railroads, but it's, you know, it's there. It's, it is there. And what you can see is except for the inner urbans, which were lightweight railroads and they could, they could, uh, accommodate higher slopes than the steam powered railroad could, especially in the early days. Okay, So uh, the use of railroads, but you see that basically the big steam railroads skirted for the most part, the Chagrin Valley okay, in heading eastward, either south of the Chagrin, sorry, south of the Chagrin or north uh, along the Lake Plain here. All right, so railroads. And um, now I want to end with the forests. And uh, the forests of the chagrin are very interesting because the chagrin is high and it's damp. And it's damp for one reason in particular, and that is that uh, mm, the height and the closeness to Lake Erie means that most of the valley is in the snow belt, especially the northern half of it. And that the arrow signifies that. The east side has the snow belt because the east side trends northeast, the shoreline, and the escarpment trends northeast okay, from the lake shore. So on the west side, you know, you have the lake shore is trending almost due east-west, but it changes at the Cuyahoga to go this way. And what that means is that even a westward, a west wind, a west-generated wind, has enough fetch of the lake to go across to pick up moisture to dump in the Chagrin Valley and in Cleveland Heights uh, and out west, especially Concord and the like, to uh, really dump a lot of snow and rain in the warm months. Okay, so the snow belt operates 12 months a year. Uh, we notice it more in the uh, winter time. Okay, and that's opposed to the west side. You know, in Parma, Parma Heights. Seven Hills, Strongsville, a little farther south, okay, that is equally high to this area, same Sharon Sandstone, but is not part of the snow belt because you have to have a due north wind to bring the moist air across here. And that really doesn't happen. Our winds are westerly, southwest to west to northwest. Okay, so what that means is that the Chagrin Valley and the Grand Valley, but the Chagrin in particular, is a humid area compared with what's especially west of it. And that means that it's the province of the beech maple forest, which is a cool, wet forest. So now, uh, Burton is not in the Chagrin Valley, uh, but you know, it's just in the Cuyahoga, right in this area here. Uh, but the Chagrin Valley is a primary sugaring area in for early settlers and for Native Americans as well. Okay? And <clears throat> what that means is that um, there are a lot of uh, trees, a lot of big trees, especially sugar maples and beech trees, beech maple forest, okay? And uh, this past year, I did a study of the Moses Cleveland tree, so that's Cuyahoga County. And here I put all the Moses Cleveland trees, which is a couple dozen that uh, are in the eastern part of the county in the Chagrin Valley. Okay? And so this tells us nothing except where Moses tree, Cleveland trees were designated uh, in the Chagrin Valley. But I want to tell you there are big, beautiful trees of the beech maple forest. 
And here are some. The beech trees are especially uh, uh, impressive here. So uh, Bessie uh, Benner Messenbaum Park, Geauga County, and uh, Willoughby Bible Church. Look at that. That's just such a beautiful big beech tree. This one is as well. This was in the forest, but and this one has a scale, so you can tell how big that is. That tree is certainly more than 300 years old, maybe 400 years old. Beeches grow pretty slowly. And then a sugar maple in the valley on Hunting Hill Road. And then uh, Gully Brook, this wonderful uh, red oak, and a white oak, which is the classic Moses Cleveland tree in Willoughby. Okay, so there are uh, trees that hold on from the old forest. They're disappearing, they're cut down. This one, the sugar maple here, is now gone uh, just in the past year. Um, so we have to guard these trees because they are the last, they are the remnants of this fantastic force that was here in prehistoric days. Um, and uh, I want to close out this with uh, giving you an indication that I just got a couple of days ago uh, from um, Greg Wiles, who is the director of the College of Worcester Tree Ring Lab. And he's been um, studying trees all over Northeast Ohio. And uh, he gave me this curve, which is very interesting. And so the line is uh, tree ring widths, basically, okay? And a wide tree ring means it's been a good year, right? Uh, warm and moist. And a narrow tree ring, just the opposite, it's been either cold or dry or both. And uh, there's a clear trend from 1680, which is the earliest trees you can identify, earliest, yeah, uh, up to our own era here, and you see there's a lot of variation, but if you draw the line, if you draw the curve, uh, you can see that uh, our, our region, uh, and the, now I, I wanna back up and say this is from Johnson Woods in Orville, which is near Worcester where he's based, okay? And uh, in the period, it actually started a couple hundred years before 1699, 1680, uh, but uh, the earth went through what's called the Little Ice Age, where uh, for the first time since the Pleistocene, since 11,000 years ago, the temperature did drop a couple of degrees for a couple of centuries. It's called the Little Ice Age. And, uh, you know, the Broyel painting of uh, people uh, skating on the canals in Amsterdam, um, this is classic Little Ice Age uh, behavior, okay, that you can't do anymore in Amsterdam because the canals don't freeze. And we start to come out of this in, in uh, the early 1800s. So he's labeled that as the settlement time up to about 1840. And then he calls this the pluvial, which means just the, it's not ice, it's, it's rain. The water is liquid instead of ice that characterizes the environment. And you see this rise of the curve. And uh, uh, so this is the period we're in now, and presumably this curve just goes up. And what this means is that uh, minimally, tree rings get bigger, right? And if tree rings get bigger, trees are getting bigger. But when trees get bigger and grow more quickly, that is each year they put on weight, they put on mass, that means that uh, they are subject to uh, certain kinds of diseases that come in with warmth and wetness, okay? So more chances to introduce pests and especially rotting kinds of environments. And so he doesn't know where our forests are headed, but they aren't headed for the old growth that we see back here, uh, where tree rings were generally small, trees grew slowly in a cooler and drier, climate. Okay? So this is something to look out for in the future because, as we know, trees are one of the greatest things we can do to restore watersheds. So to finish off, I want to come back to restoring watersheds as an applied science. And for the Chagrin River, taking directly from the balanced growth plan of a few years ago, um, the causes of impairment, you can read them. I don't have to do it for you, but I want you to read those and then look over here. And it's the mouth of the chagrin, the estuarine area, that really, mm, I want to say, embodies or 
it embodies all the problems we have, which direct habitat alteration, poor alteration, lead to siltation erosion and siltation organic nutrients. Here is the silt and clay, the nutrients coming from the whole watershed uh, going into Lake Erie here. And this is, remember I started out by saying that the chagrin is the siltiest of our regional rivers. And everything that we do to alter habitat and the flow and get rid of trees that enable the water to be warmer and carry more, that leads to these kinds of problems that we see at an apex here at the, uh, <clears throat> uh, at the end of this uh, the river. All right, last slide. If we look, from my point of view, my long-term geologically oriented point of view, what, what, how can we look 200 years in the future to restore the Chagrin River, to you know, keep it healthy? And a couple of things come out. These days in a changing climate in which rain is more frequent and heavier, we're just wetter than we used to be and it looks like it's going to stay around. Okay? Um, we're always looking for storage, the ability to slow water down, slow runoff down in the watersheds, keep it from entering the main streams and therefore entrenching those streams, uh, eroding and taking that silt and clay downstream and redepositing it called siltation. Okay, So the chagrin has a couple of resources in its upper areas, its headwater areas. And again, it's back to these pre-glacial valleys. Some of them are uh, stable in the sense that the streams are not dropping and there are quite a few wetlands. There are the natural means to store runoff. And the main branch above Chagrin Falls is the primary case here. Uh, some of you may know the rookery and next door to it is the um, Always Mill Golf Course. I showed the picture there with the wetland converted into a lake. That's the kind of thing that we really can't let go on. Uh, because lakes are not as good as, as storing water naturally as is a wetland. So we have to conserve wetlands in these areas that are prone to wetlands. It's easier to conserve a wetland than it is to build a wetland. Okay? And uh, so there's a, a, there are possibilities. There are resources to slow water down. There are good possibilities to to make a, a process that's already there, natural storage, to improve it in the long run. Okay, the problem areas are, sorry, the problem areas are in these uh, deeply cutting areas here. And uh, that is where we need the trees, okay? Because the trees hold the runoff and uh, they, they're able to uh, absorb runoff that is flowing downhill quickly. Trees are important in the wetlands as well, but I would say that that where we want to focus on planting trees are in all these wrinkle type areas here. And you see the photograph I had of the East Branch floodplain, that's this marvelous feature right here. You know, I don't know if that's paying agriculture or not, but it would sure be nice to reforest that stretch of floodplain there. <clears throat> And in these areas, once, once again, the old meander scars uh, are now heavily occupied. You know, there are just residences and residences all through here. And it's not the best thing, but they're there. So we have to encourage tree planting, canopy tree planting there. Okay. All right. I think, yeah, that's uh, my last slide. So let's talk about questions. Sure, Roy, thank you. That was extremely interesting. Um, just a reminder to people, you can use the chat window. It should be in the uh, panel on the right-hand side of your screen there to um, answer or ask any questions. Um, Donnie wants to know, was the quarry found along Jackson Road in Moreland Hills near Wiley Creek a commercial stone quarry? Um, it was right along the Interurban Railroad. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, but it, uh, the inter, if it's along the interurban railroad, it probably had an interurban use. All right. 
I don't mean to say that there were no quarries in the Chagrin Valley, but there were very few commercial quarries. There was the one uh, that I mentioned on the Aurora Ranch and uh, another one uh, near the Kirtland Temple. Uh, but there were small quarries here and there everywhere, and it's especially bridge abutments so that there were the destination for stone from these early quarries. And inner urbans needed uh, bridges uh, over creeks and over the Chagrin River itself. So I, I don't know that quarry, but it wouldn't surprise me that that was a railroad oriented quarry as many were in our area. Um, have there been any fossil records of short-faced bears, American lions, giant ground sloths, or camels found in the Chagrin River watershed? Wow. <laughs> uh, the short answer is no. Those are all Pleistocene fauna. And, um, you know, I don't know of any. If they exist, they would be in that rookery area where you have lakes, anywhere you have these pre-glacial valleys that have silted up, you have chances to find fossils. I don't know of any from the chagrin. There are, mm, the, those mentioned are, they're not common, those animals mentioned are not commonly found fossilized. In Northeast Ohio, the common terminal Pleistocene fauna is megafauna, okay? So, uh, Mastodon and mammoth, okay? You can't miss those and their bones preserve well. Um, there have been a, a few camels, uh, but I think it's uh, bison, bison and elk. Those are basically that, but that's the Grand Valley and also in the Cuyahoga. Once again, I don't know of any fossils, megafauna fossils or even smaller animals uh, from the late Pleistocene or the early Holocene from the Chagrin. Interesting. Um, is Caves Creek daylighted? Are there caves in the area and is Caves Road in Chesterland named for these? Yes. Hey, and um, <clears throat> this Caves Road, Caves Creek, uh, Caves Creek drains um, the, I don't know if it has a name, that knob, but it's Patterson's uh, Fruit Farm, Patterson's Orchard up there that's now um, Orchard Hill, Orchard Hill uh, Reservation of Geauga Metro Parks, uh, Park District. And um, Caves Road, though, runs along the base of the Sharon exposure, the knob exposure there. And there are caves in the sense of the, um, the caves that you find at Chapin or Thompson's or Nelson's Ledges or Virginia Kendall Park, that is, they the the stone uh, the ledges or the knobs uh, they are on a, a soft footing a shale footing that erodes away and the bedrock above it the hard bedrock cracks and starts to slide downhill so you get crevices uh, they're joints in the rock that have spread so you can walk uh, in them uh, and sometimes they'll have a block over them that's maybe fallen down on them. They are not real caves, but for the early settlers, they were cave enough that uh, they were called caves. And uh, it's uh, south, I don't even know if it's in the Chagrin Valley, but if you go Caves Road all the way to the south into Geauga County, there is, um, I can't remember the name, but there actually is a, a cave uh, da, 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 da. If the asker of that question wants to email me, Eric, you can give my email address and I can uh, uh, show where there is something that resembles a real cave uh, on that exposure line. Okay? Yeah, will do. Um, Jeff wants to know, is the Conversion of Acacia Country Club to a metro park, the planting of trees, and the lowering of creek banks in the park, a good example of responsible conversion to a forested floodplain. They had attended a Lindhurst Garden Club meeting, and Metro Parks representatives mentioned their goal was to keep water on the reservation as opposed to moving it off property. Right. You know, it doesn't get any better than Metro Parks taking over something. Um, metro Parks is the institution that is well funded by taxpayers and um, it is well run uh, as far as we know there's no corruption at all within the system 
and when they do something, they do it right. Okay, so Metro Parks, watershed scientists, uh, they, they have quite a few specialists in, in forestry, hydrology, ecology of various types. Okay, and uh, all that's been done at Acacia is top notch. And as I think I said, it doesn't get any better than that. Now, the other park districts, Geauga, Lake, um, they're smaller. Of course, they don't have the resources, but they also do good jobs. And there is, mm, we're, we're in a rush to, to conserve land. So we have our land conservancies. And of course, uh, the big one in the chagrin is the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. Uh, but there's also the West Creek Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, and these are all oriented toward uh, purchasing or being gifted uh, land, sensitive lands. And uh, we've come a long way, but it's a it's a kind of losing battle because, of course, the developers can always uh, seemingly always pay more, and you know are always looking to acquire land, especially on the periphery because that's where people want to live these days. So it's a battle between land conservancies who then are able to give it over to municipalities or park districts, such as Lake Geauga or uh, Cleveland Metro Parks. Okay, so that's that. That's the, the best way the system can work these days. Land conservancies assembling the funds to purchase and then giving over to some park district and park districts then having the staff to scientifically restore these areas. Awesome. Um, well, I think that about wraps it up. Um, if you have a question that wasn't answered, I will send out, um, I'll send out my email as well as a follow up um, with a re, you know with a link to record this video and I'll include Dr. Larrick's um, email in that for any of you who have questions for him. Um, thank you again, Dr. Larrick of Bluestone Conservation, um, and thank you all for attending. Uh, really appreciate it. We hope to see you at the next speaker series. Uh, well, you're welcome. And may I say just one more here. Um, I have, uh, I kind of grew up in the chagrin, so I love it. And I put this together, this is the first time I presented it, and I went about a third longer than I wanted. I apologize for that. But um, uh, that's how much I love this area. Well, yeah, we can see your passion, and it's, it's truly, truly interesting. That was, that was fascinating. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yes. And for being Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year to you as well. Everyone, take care.